If you think you could never be vegan, you're in the right place. And if you think there's something big you'd really like to do, but it's probably too late, you're in the right place. My name's Michelle Olander, and I think there has never been a more important time to move in a vegan direction. So I'm here every week to cheer you on and offer you actionable tips and strategies as you veg your best. Episode 140, More Plants, Less Waste with Max Lamana. Welcome back, my veg your besties. Welcome back. You know, waste not, want not is an old expression, but it's been given some new life with this week's guest, Max Lamana. Max Lamana, chef and climate activist, is spotlighting, uh, I guess you'd say, the intersection of veganism and the zero waste movements in a really marvelous and accessible way. And he's inviting us, all of us, to a more plants, less waste mindset. And I think you will see how we can at least be part of the solution in our kitchens and in our daily routines with some of the advice and inspiration Max offers. Max's new book is called You Can Cook This, and uh, it turns out you can. You can cook beautiful dishes with many of the foods and parts of the foods that most of us end up wasting. Max has a huge Instagram presence, and he asked his followers on Instagram to tell him what ingredients they typically wasted or threw out. And this, his second book, was born. You can cook this. It's ingenious. So I sent a copy of You Can Cook This to my fellow vegan podcasters, Sam and Christine at Compassion and Cucumbers, because I know they cook something from a cookbook every month, maybe every week. I, I can't I can't remember their exact schedule, but I said, would you would you like this book and would you like to cook something from it in coordination with my interview with Max Lamana? And so if you enjoy today's interview with Max, you can immediately go over and listen to episode 86 of Compassion and Cucumbers to hear about the recipe they chose and cooked from the book. And when I say they, I mean Christine. I think I mean Christine. Christine's the usual cook and Sam is her taste tester. So look for that recipe from You Can Cook This. But right now, right now, I hope you'll enjoy hearing from a young man who's bringing his energy, his talents, brains, and ethics to help us, each of us, reduce food waste in a really delicious way. And I think with a lot of fun, and in the end, I'll let you know how you can get a free copy of his book as a gift to you, my listeners, from me. Max Lamana, welcome to Veg Your Best Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a delight. It's a delight. I've been looking at your book. Um, I've got the digital version. I know about your previous book. This is your second book, right? So congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. So many people, that's their bucket list goal is one book. You're a young man. You've already got two. And <laughs> <laughs> the North American uh, version is coming out tomorrow, I think, which is April 11th when we're recording this. Um, and you're in the UK. So yours has been out for a little bit, the the UK version, correct? Yeah, it has. It has been out for a little bit. Um, it's nice to see the excitement from the UK and, uh, you know, it, it's exciting to see people's excitement. It's exciting to see that. Um, and having having the North American version come out, you know, a few days later tomorrow um, is also another kind of it is. It, it, there's only one word to describe it. It, it just feels ex very exciting. So uh, <laughs> sorry for my lack of uh, vocabulary, um, but it's exciting. No, it's great. I mean, I think it it just shows you're not jaded by uh, your your <laughs> your publishing success yet. You you can save that for another decade. So what you you are an American, and you have lived in Australia, correct? And worked in Australia, and now you live in the UK. So mm. tell me, uh, how does 
plant-based, vegan, low waste? How does that vary in these different Anglophone environments? I think plant-based and no waste cooking are very, they can be very, very, very closely related. Vegetables are, are, you know, you go to a supermarket and if you're not plant-based, it's a lot harder to, or excuse me, it's a lot easier to be no waste because the butcher has already done um, all the kind of using up the 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 the, the ingredient uh, already for you. So when it comes to plants, there's 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 more of us. There's more there's more to use in the ingredients. So you have to be a little bit more creative. And I I enjoy that. I love being creative. I love having a little bit of a challenge when it comes to the cooking the food I have um, and trying to make use of it. But it ends up. I end up using more of the money that I've spent on food so I can make, you know, a veg stock using the scraps and the peelings that I have, or I can uh, use the entire ingredient so I can bulk out my dish a little bit further. So um, it, it, it comes with its challenges, but also can be, can be, you know, can be fun and, and joyful. Well, I think that's the impression we get from your book. And the second book is called You Can Cook This. That's how I hear it in my head when I read you it. Can. You can. <laughs> you can. I love that. You can cook this. And it's because you did a very clever thing, I think, is you use social media to uh, ask people, what is it that goes to waste in your fridge or in your pantry? What don't you even know how to use? And I thought I understood what some of the obvious ones were, but some of them were kind of surprising that I never expected to hear would be would go into your world of uh, you can actually cook this. So why don't you give me a sense of what were some of the ones that were surprising to you when people, you know, many of your thousands of your followers said, on, on Instagram said, I end up with this. It was all surprising that people are, are are throwing food away. I mean, everything, when I was asking, when I asked my audience which foods they're throwing away, every single ingredient came up on in, in, in the results. But there were, there, were, there were some of the household staples that just kept repeating themselves over and over and over again. Bread and potatoes, bag salad, which I can understand because I feel you bring a bag of salad home, you turn your back, it's it's gone soft. It's mushy. You don't want to eat it. Um, bananas were going off, and people are throwing away bananas and the peeled bananas. So there's there's some ingredients I was surprised. I mean, everything was being thrown away. Um, but I know that people can just if they store their ingredients a little bit better, they'll end up getting the most out of their food. So um, I had to impart some of that knowledge of this is how you store those ingredients. Um, because a lot of people are storing food improperly. They're just shoving food into their fridge thinking, well, the fridge is the 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 safest bet. That that the fridge will save my food and it'll keep my food fresh. And sometimes that's not the case. It's how you store your food. Mm. So is there one thing you would say from this day on, listeners, never make this mistake again. This very simple thing that most of you are doing incorrectly. Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, the, the number one most wasted ingredient that people are throwing away is potatoes or mm -hmm. are potatoes. So people, how to store your potatoes, the best way to store potatoes is keeping them in a cool, dry, dark, well-ventilated store cupboard. You can keep them in a bowl, keep them on a tray, but cover them with a newspaper, uh, but keep them, you know, well-ventilated and it really, can, it has to be cool and well-ventilated. People are storing their potatoes in the fridge. They're storing them next to onions and garlic, which releases chemicals, and that helps the potato go, starts to decay and go into resprouting. And they keep them near warm electric outlets like an oven or a refrigerator. And that also speeds up the process of the potato going into this new this new stage of life, sprouting and uh, turning green. So store your potatoes properly in a cool well-ventilated, dry cupboard. That's excellent because I think most people, in spite of the carb, the carb phobia so many people have, most people still uh, function with potatoes in the home. So that's great. That's great to know. No one will ever have a sprouted green potato again if they if and then they, and they should use them right. They can then cook them and then save them cooked if they're not using them. Yeah, you know what? What I did and what was interesting, um, I went through 
several different supermarkets. When I was doing the testing and the developing for this book, I went through different supermarkets and looked in the freezer sections of all these supermarkets to see which foods are being frozen in bags. And everything was being frozen. Every, you know, not everything. Most things were being kept frozen. And so I just thought, okay, if potatoes could be, you know, cooked and then drained and then put into a, a Ziploc bag and frozen, then, you know, if they're doing that at the supermarkets, then I can do, I can do the exact same thing at home. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's look, I, I would, I would impart that kind of knowledge on people look in the supermarkets and see what they're freezing in their freezer section, because the freezer is a great space to keeping and extending the shelf life of food. Because at the end of the day, you know, people are wasting food, people are throwing away food, whether you say you're not, you you probably are like very few people are not using up everything they bring into their own home. Um, the average American household wastes around fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars of edible food every single year. That's that's a that's a big chunk of money, and you know that's the question I'd like to ask people: What would you do with that sort of money right now in today's economy in today's climate? So you know, the next time you're at the supermarket, just Take a look into the freezer section and see, take a note of what the supermarkets are keeping in their freezer and then try to do that and implement that in your own home. Very good strategy, I think. It's, and simple. It you don't, doesn't require too much that we don't have sitting around, right? Yeah, you don't need to buy buy a fancy new equipment as long as you have a freezer at freezer. home. Right, yeah. right. Now, so your first book was much more about waste, right? It was that, that so that was one of the things that, um, you gave us good ideas about how to avoid waste in the first book. And now you're actually showing us how we can actually enjoy, like super enjoy, make delicious meals and add to the meals that we're making with uh, the ingredients that we're not throwing out. Exactly. I, I think it needs to, you know, I, I've done a lot of learning. I've done a lot of testing and done a, a lot of tasting and eating and cooking over, over the, over the time, over that period. So it only made sense to show, okay, what do people really want? And I, you know, I had to ask my audience what people really, really wanted. We just want something that's quick and easy and delicious. We want it on the plate, on the table, you know, soon. Um, you know, occasionally there were people who were saying, you know, I'm, I'm cooking for a large family. I'm cooking for parties. I'm, this is, this is how I cook. So I try to take in as much information as I can and get ins inspiration from um, my audience. So this was, you know, still staying true to my values and my 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 mission to waste less food in the home and help people cook le cook cook more food and create less waste in, in in the home, but also start to bring them into the cookbook. Why do we why do we spend so much money on food and why do we waste so much food? And how do how do I get what they want into a book? So that's that was kind of the the the, mes the mission here in this second one. Well, I love it when people use uh, social media for po for power powerfully positive um, results, and this certainly was on your on your on your part. When you know a lot of people who who work with me or listen to this podcast, one of their many reasons for being plant based or vegan is to um, is to positively impact climate change and the and the environment. And food waste is something some of us may not even think about what an impact that is because that that food is being grown created it has a, an effect on our planet and the people and the food uh, trucks and and the delivery and then packaging all this stuff is happening and then we throw it away so it's uh, it's not a um it's not a victimless crime is it yeah every every step of the process it, you know, there's food that's being wasted everywhere. I always see us as sort of this this last line of defense for food. If it makes its way to us, then it's it's our our responsibility to take care of it and to and when I mean by take care of it, use it, cook it, eat it, um, share it, be, yeah, and share it, <laughs> yeah, cherish it, enjoy it. All these things. Food is food is such a powerful. Um, vehicle to bring people together. Um, and I say this in, in, in the beginning of the book, I say, there's no judgment here. Um, there's no judgment, no discrimination. It doesn't matter what you eat. If you, if you label yourself as vegan or plant-based, I think everyone is welcome to the table. I don't see 
too many cookbooks out there or people messaging saying, hey, everyone's welcome to the table. I'm not here to say, hey, you need to do this. You need to go and and eat this sort of way in your life because I know that it's not accessible for everyone. Mm. There are places around the world. There's cities and neighborhoods. There are places, you know, jobs and uh, just the, the, the societal uh, issues around the world that don't allow people to eat a certain way. So, you know, everyone's welcome to the table. And, uh, I, th- I think everyone, uh, you know, if you cook, if you're cooking the recipes from my book, then you're, you're just going to end up eating more plants. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you are someone who thinks, you know, there are some smug vegans in this world, I know it's hard to believe. And, uh, <laughs> some of them, they, there's always more for people to do to, um, wh- you learn one thing, you learn how to maybe have a smaller carbon footprint in one aspect of your life, but then there's more, you talk about plastic, I think in your last book, more than maybe mm-hmm. than this one, but plastic is a perennial problem for almost any human being living, living today. Um, and we want to use plastic for when it's necessary, when it really is important for some sort of hygienic reasons and medical purposes, but it's just everywhere in the supermarket, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's 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 difficult to avoid. Um, it's difficult to avoid. So again, it's not every supermarket's going to have that option. You know, if you if you feel outraged by it, I think speak up, say something, write a letter to your supermarket, call them up, send them an email. I think the the power of your voice or the, just your voice in, in general it could be very, very powerful. I think I came across some s- statistic that said one call or one email or just one letter to your 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 representative, your your government official, uh, you know, in this case, <laughs> a supermarket is the power of 50,000 other people who are also speaking up. So there's probably 50,000 other people who are thinking and wanting to say the same thing, but they decide not to because they don't want to go through the hassle. So if Mm. all of us are then saying something and we're writing a letter, power and change can really, really, really happen. But again, I don't think it's, you know, telling somebody to, hey, be zero waste. And I know that was... I've done a lot of learning from book one to book two. I don't think it's accessible for everyone to be zero waste. If you can and can reduce your food waste and you can reduce your plastic waste, great, do that. If you have the means and the funds and the the time and the accessibility to do so, do it. But it's it's we zoom out a little bit. It's not accessible for everyone. There's there's obstacles and and challenges for everyone to get to that point. And there may be, you know. People are all all in different kind of, we're all on different scales in in terms of uh, achieving those goals. That's absolutely true. And I think it's it's always good to remind ourselves that even uh, we don't want to make perfection the enemy of making a difference, trying a little harder, being open to maybe there's another way. I've been doing it this way for a while. No, I know I hide behind. I am an avid composter <laughs> and I, I can Love rationalize. That. Well, it's going... To the compost. Yeah. It's going to be used in the garden. That's going. To, it's going to feed the you know the earthworms and things out there. So I can sometimes rationalize my food waste with compost. So you can. <laughs> there's better. There. I can do better. I can do better. And that and that and that's great. I think everyone. You know. I think we all can say to ourselves every day, just do better. Just do better. And then do better. What's what's holding you back? Um, and if there are things holding you back, then address those. But I think we, you know, you and I, we can, we can do better. I know I can do better. So, yeah. yeah. And also, and sometimes, and there's so much to think about there. Where is this food coming? Is it seasonal or has it been trucked and flown at huge expense from another, another hemisphere to my supermarket? So we can do better on a, a myriad of ways, but I would love to know, okay, I have to ask about banana peels because it never occurred to me that banana peels should go anywhere except my compost. Mm. Banana peels. (laughs) A lot of people, when I asked my audience, which foods they were throwing away, they were, you know, they were saying bananas. And then I'm thinking, well, what about the banana? If you're throwing away the banana, then you must be throwing away the peel. It's two, two different parts, (laughs) two parts to that. You know, it's not just one thing. So um, and then I, and I did some research and learned that in most Southeast Asian countries, they're using 
banana peels. And there's different types of bananas. There's thousands of varieties of different bananas around the world. But we're, you know, in the global north, we're accustomed to the yellow traditional banana that we see in the supermarket. I don't know the name of that banana, but I just call it the yellow banana. That banana peel can be consumed. And I've made it in recipes before. I've tried it. And I thought, well, there, this has to be in the book. This is going to catch people's eye. And people have tried it before. And people have tagged me on social media saying, oh, it was delicious. And I'm just thinking, oh, my goodness. I can't believe like people are eating. But I, I share one recipe video. People are eating it. I might as well put it in the cookbook. It'll reach more people this way, too. So it's definitely, you know, you could definitely eat it. It needs to be marinated and spiced heavily. You don't really taste the banana flavor, um, but it could be baked. It could be fried in, in a frying pan, and it's a great way of using up everything. The only thing I do ask is that make sure that the banana peel is organic because mm. bananas are heavily sprayed. Yeah, that's a very good uh, caveat because a lot of the food we do get that's not organic is waxed or has mm. all... Well, you actually, even organic food can sometimes be waxed, Correct. I it de- I think it de- really depends on where the food is coming from. Mm. You know, if I'm shopping at the local farmer's market uh, and it's a small stall and it's a local farmer, independent farmer, chances are that it's probably not going to be waxed. But if it's coming from a bigger conglomerate, bigger farmer, it could be. It de- it, again, it depends on like apples, for instance. I think sometimes I've seen, th- you know, information that apples – even if they're organic, can be can be waxed. Um, but I think it's maybe a little bit more of a, a con- uh, the waxed conversation is more in America because I don't really see or hear the conversation of waxed ingredients in the UK. Oh, that's interesting. Something something for me to Google. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna re- I'm gonna do some research after this as well. Good, good, good. We'll add it so, in the show notes. <laughs> well, you know. Um, you're a young person. You have already gotten two books. You know some, so much about food waste. You have a beautiful uh, social media following. The second book, You Can Cook This. Um, this is not how you started out, right? This is not no. the, the trajectory that you expected to find yourself on a while back. Mm. It's, an, it's, it's an interesting story. I've done, I've worked a plethora of jobs. I got that impression from your bio. <laughs> I've been all over the place. I've worked a lot of jobs, but food has been the one constant in my life. I actually started thinking about what was the what was the last job I had that wasn't in food? And it took me a long I've I mean I've worked numbers of jobs. I worked close to 20 or 30 different jobs, but all of them have been in food. Um so it, it, for for me, food has played an important role in my life from being, you know, from a child, um, you know, eating food and staying alive and being healthy to grow and everything all plays a role. But I think the story even for me starts when my father bought his first two quick service restaurants when I was two weeks old. And then he had that for 13, 14 years. And then at the age of 15, 16, I ended up working in a pizza restaurant and that was my first foot in the door, you know, uh, getting a weekly paycheck. Um, and then from there I started working in restaurants and food has always played a, a role in my life. It always kind of played in the background because I was always pursuing something else. Um, at 20, I moved to New York city where I started modeling and then got into acting, went to acting school for a few years, did a few, uh, small theater shows, not way off Broadway, off, off, like not even nowhere near Broadway, um, <laughs> out of, out of that area. So, and then I started doing, um, some shorter, you know, university films, uh, and that my one kind of big job that I, I ever did. And it was the kind of the last, it was actually the last job too. First, first big job and last job. Um, I, I was on days of our lives for a couple episodes and, I was, you know, I was trying to, I was really, really loved the, the, the atmosphere and the, the passion for, for acting, getting into a character, all, all of that. But food was always playing a role in, in, in the background. And, uh, it, it, it came, it, it came time where I had to really look myself in the mirror and, and think to myself, is this, do I keep, do I keep going? Things aren't clicking. 
It just didn't, there was, there was a moment, I think I gave myself a year and for a year, I, I just thought, all right, if it doesn't happen this year, then you need to re you just need to refocus and, and think about what, what you want. And that moment did come. So I had to refocus and reshift my, my, my view. And so, you know, you, you certainly use your appearance, your, your physicality, your personality in a lot of your Instagram videos, your social media videos. And so we get to see you cooking. We get to see you um, interacting as a, um, maybe it's a character, maybe it's you. I'm not sure. Is, is there a persona <laughs> or is it, is it the Max no, this, Lamana? <laughs> no, this is, this is me. This is, Great. this is all. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. I don't persona sometimes i think should i have a persona maybe no i think yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe i think to i'm protect so yourself yeah you know what but my my i've used my name in in the showbiz so there's no way of kind of well i was you know max Lamana, the, the 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 you know the model and an actor and i guess there is a bit of like protection there because you're playing a role but i'm i was always max Lamana, so like there's things that you can you know you find out about me so i thought I need to, how am I going to connect? This is it. How am I going to connect with people? I'm going to try to inspire them. I'm going to help them transform the way they, they see food. I'm going to help them, you know, educate the way they see and cook food. So staying, you know, staying true to those principles. And um, for me, it's, this is, I think just being real and honest is just the the way to go for that's me. Great. That's, it just works for me. It works for me that way. So um I, I want to be honest and true with everyone. And then that's, you know, that's for you to decide. Is it a persona? Of course, that's it's <laughs> very wise. That's actually very wise. It is up to us to decide. The the um, the role that you're playing, though, is now something that connects with us yeah. several more or more times per day because we are either shopping for food, consuming food, preparing food, putting the food away. That's something that... Um, once you get in our heads, Max, you uh, were thinking, what would Max do in my kitchen right now? What would Max do with my freezer or my um, my herbs when I bring them from the farmer's market? What would he suggest? <laughs> something's something's clicking in place because I I get people saying this all the time. And, you know, as you know, my new books is going to be out soon. And everyone keeps saying this, that you're in the back of my mind when I shop now for food. So something, something's, you know, clicking in place and, and it's working. So, and that's, and, and that goes back to my, my principles of trying to inspire and transform and educate. I can't change you. I can't, I, I can say whatever I want to say. It's up to you to make that change yourself. I can't physically say, you know, grab those ingredients and do this. No, I'm, I'm giving you the tools. I'm giving you the blueprint it's up to you to make that decision and you're going to you're going to champion that when you when you decide to take that 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 next step to wasting less food to cooking and enjoying more plants on your plate to whatever it is to storing your ingredients better to putting those potatoes in, in the cupboard right now um it's all you know it's up to you it's going to be up to you so hopefully that voice in the back of your head is is the is a is a nice uh calm voice that i have that says Yes. Use the ingredient. Use all of it. You can cook this. And, and you can cook this. <laughs> it's great. So I'm curious, um, what is your process? So a book is a big undertaking. Mm. A cookbook, uh, you have recipe testers usually, or sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're family members, sometimes they're a mixture of both or friends. Can you give us a little insight into how you how you wrote your book? It's a fun process. I enjoy this. I I hope to see I hope there's more cookbooks to come because it's a really really fun process. It's no one, you know, there's a small group of people who know you're writing a book and then the rest of the world doesn't know. So, you feel kind of you're keeping a secret and the process for me for this this last book cuz I had 2 years to from the from the idea to the actual print as will be, you know, uh, in, when it's in stores, will be a little over two years. Going through each step, each each phase of the process, I try to enjoy it, try to be present and enjoy this journey. It's not about the destination. It's about being present in that moment and enjoying it. And for me to, you know, testing and tasting and developing and creating these recipes is the, the most joyful part because this is where I can have some fun. 
be a little bit, be, be, you know, be a child in the kitchen and goof around and see what works, what doesn't work. I mean, there's a recipe in my book for a no waste cereal milk ice cream using up the whole making a bowl of cereal. You know, we've all been there before. We make a bowl of cereal maybe, and we've just left it off on the side and we forget about it and gone, oh, it's too soft and, and mushy. So how do we use up the, the, that, that bowl of cereal, the milk and the, um, the cereal itself? So for me, it's also going into restaurants and, you know, I, I'll have a, I don't really have a notepad on me. I'm not like I'm a food critic. I should start doing that. So they think maybe I'm a food critic. Um, but I just have my, my, my phone with me. And if I taste something or if I see something that really stands out for me, I'll make a, I'll make a note of it or I'll take a photo of it and I'll go and review that photo later or th those notes that I made. And I try to, um, revision, revision or, um, um, bring that that feeling again of, again of the dish that I've just enjoyed and try to see if I can emulate and evoke that same moment that I had in the restaurant and try to make that as a dish. So one of the dishes I've I've made was a marinated beet and toasted pistachios, orange and mint dish. And this, in the UK, we say beetroot. So I'm just sorry for the listeners. I'm just going to say beetroot. The beetroot is marinated uh, with sherry vinegar and olive oils roasted, baked in the in the oven. Once it comes out, you marinate it with shallot and gin, uh, ginger, and orange, uh, zest and juice, and that sits. You know, you can marinate it for two to three days. But the reason I found out, the reason I did this dish is because I went and had had it at a restaurant about two years ago, and it was this beautiful moment, and I really enjoyed. It. I actually had the. The wait staff. I said, I need to. I need to speak to the chef, and they thought something was wrong. <laughs> I said, this. I said, I'm really sorry to take. I, it was a quiet. It was quiet in the in the restaurant, so I knew that I wasn't bothering him. I wouldn't recommend anyone just doing that uh, on the whim. But I said, I said, chef, this is this is something else. What did you what What did you do? He says, oh well, the secret is marinating it for three days, and I'm like, oh my goodness. So. Um, I took inspiration from that, wrote it on a piece of paper, brought it home with me and started kind of developing something that, you know, evoked that memory, that moment for me. So I try to do a lot of that. I try to try, I try to taste different foods from different restaurants, uh, get inspiration from other people all the time. So, well, there's such a variety of very beautiful, um, recipes in, in your book I'm looking at right now. And I, I wonder if you want to, um, if you want to credit your photographer at all. Oh my goodness. He... Yes. She, she's amazing. Lizzie Mason. So it was every step. So back to enjoying the, each step in the process of doing this book when it came to, okay, who, who's going to shoot the book? Who's going to, um, who's going to be the photographer? I, went across the, the the plethora of cookbooks I have, um, went online and started searching up photographers that are in London and came across Lizzie Mason. And I've worked with her in the past. So it just, it felt right. It clicked in place. I felt like her and I can have a conversation and she'll understand what I'm trying to um, bring to the page. I said, I want the images of the food to be closer up. I want you to crop in closer. I don't want um, you know, you see a lot of cookbooks and the images will have pots and pans and cups and napkins and so, like all these kind of like knickknacks all around scattered around. And then there's the food in the center of the, of the image. And I've said, this book is just about food. Let's make this book just about food. And so she's like, I get it. I understand. I know what you want. Minimal props. We're just going to get the food. Perfect. So, um, she's brilliant. She's so talented. Um, I hope I can continue to work with her. I hope she doesn't get too, too, uh, too big, too big for me and uh, leave leave me on the on the on the wayside. But um, yeah, she's great. She's amazing. Yeah, I love the photographs. I'm glad I'm glad you credited her credited her because and I, it's funny that you say that you had that vision to see the food and not so much the you know the context that it's in because I do find sometimes people. are are intimidated by that. If you have a kitchen that does not compare with some sort of stylized, fabulous, may not even be the chef's kitchen. Chefs may have gorgeous kitchens, but sometimes they have much more uh, working working environments. And some of these some of these uh, 
uh, surroundings we see in cookbooks are just like, oh my God, I don't even have any business cooking. <laughs> this is just, I can never make it look like this gorgeous room that it's in. Yeah. I think there's making it feel real and honest and truthful. I just wanted the food to come off the pages. So when you flip, when, when we eat food, we're, you know, we're an arm's length, maybe away from the food. You know, it's not that far from us. It's maybe a one to two feet, depending on how tall you are and how long your torso is. Um, so I wanted to have that same sort of distance from the page when you look at it on the table to to your to your, you know to your, your 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 eyes. So it was all about just making it true and honest and letting the food fall naturally. You know, the the stylists on the on the team when they they have to do some of their magic to make things look a little bit more enjoyable and exciting, like. I remember um, being on set and uh, one of the, I have these spicy baked cauliflower wings and this food stylist had a paintbrush, a paintbrush, like a small, like paintbrush. I'm like, what are you doing with the paintbrush? She's like, oh, I'm just going to dip it into the sauce and just kind of smear it on the plate. I'm like, why don't we just put the food on the plate and just move one of the items of food. So then there's the leftover kind of imprint and mark <laughs> of the food. She says, no, 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 that's just, trust me. We're going to do it with this paintbrush. It's so, it's so funny. I've never. Was she right? Did it look great? I, I mean, the image, the image looks great. I think they used, they used a few of those images in the book. It's, they, they know what they're doing. So I'm at times I do question, but then I, at some point go, wait, this is, this is your realm. This is your world. This is, you know what you're doing. I'm. I. I put my arms up and just. I trust this. I trust this process. And that's that's me in this whole and whole entire book is just trusting the process. Because I tested 300 recipes for this book and only 135 made it to the finish line. Um. So I have to just trust the process. And it's a collaboration. Obviously, you've got your you've got your publisher. You've got your photographer. You've got you know your your all this work that you're doing personally. So do you, you don't have to tell me what it is, but do you have an, an, another book in mind that you're working on? Yes. Um, I was really fortunate and I'm, I'm really grateful and lucky that my literary agent called me about a month ago. And she said, look, time to start planning the next one. We're going to get on a call with, with the publishers soon and start thinking about the next one. And if you, if, if that was a phone call I had, a couple of years ago, I would have gone, yeah, let's do it. Yes, yes, yes. Amazing. Uh, this time around, I just said, uh, my literary agent is Rachel Mills. And I said, Rachel Mills, I say her full name. I never just call her by her first name. I said, Rachel Mills. I said, I want to just enjoy this process. I just want, I like, I made it this far. We're just, we're, we're, we're this close to, to the finish line. We're not there yet. Let me just make it all the way to the finish line. And then, we can have that that conversation because I think a lot of people in this space will start to think about what's next, what's five years from now, what's 10 years from now, what am I doing tomorrow? And for me, I try to stay present throughout this whole process. And I think that's why in my own, I'm, you know, my own opinion, the recipes are so delicious. They're so mouthwatering, simple and delicious and easy for people to just start cooking at home. So and that I think helps when you are present because it stays it stays true throughout the whole entire book. Yeah, I think I think that's a, it means you're also enjoying the process a little bit more than if you're already swept away in the next in the next phase. So the, your last section of your book, you can cook this, is um, the very divisive, polarizing s- subject matter of leftovers. Um, I have I have a family where we have very different camps. I am very pro leftover. Mm-hmm. Where where did the problem happen with leftovers? Um, a lot of people were just saying how, oh, I end up throwing my leftovers away. I don't know what it is. I think they're afraid of having something that's been cooked and it doesn't look as presentable as the dish they in- initially uh, pulled together. The other inspiration for this was people I know are going to cook some of these recipes in my book. They're going to be leftovers. So I'm going to take some of the recipes I have earlier in the book and 
bring them into this leftover section and give them a new life, mm. kind of give them, yeah, a new, a new life because leftovers are delicious. And it's one of the largest areas of food waste in the household. So like I said earlier, we waste around $1,500 to $1,800 of edible food every single year per household in the U.S. So, and a lot of that comes from having the, having these leftovers. So I just thought we gotta, we have to, inc- we have to incorporate them in some way. Well, you're, you've also photographed them very nicely. So maybe they don't look, they don't look, but some people consider um, to be unappetizing. I love leftovers. There's nothing, nothing better for me than to look into in the fridge and see a whole bunch of things uh, put, put away from the night before or two nights before to kind of, I mean, I love to put them, um, my mother always would turn things into a hash, would like put mm. everything into together and then pan fry it on the uh, cast iron skillet and make like a, some sort of a pancake type of thing um, yeah. and or or thrown in in pasta. So my, my mother was a very basic cook. Um, and also my mother was this is one of the things I was going to ask you about, because generationally, my parents both grew up um, very much um, influenced by the Depression and the Second World War, where there was rationing. There was they were poor. Um, and, and so food waste was a a thing I heard about all the time as a child. I don't think I raised my kids that way. I think I raised my kids more with, I don't want to push you to eat something you don't want to eat. So there was more of that kind of like kind of laid off on eating everything on your plate or putting it away. And so I think there's a pendulum in, in terms of how families approach food. And I'm wondering what you see in terms of people, younger people like yourself in terms of how they're approaching uh, in the family, food waste. How, what are th- some things you can do with your family? I think what's really important is getting the f- everyone on board and having a conversation around the meals you're going to enjoy that week. I think it's really, I think it's really, it, it, it could be fun. It could be exciting to, if you have little ones, if you have children around, what are we going to have for dinner this week? What do you want? And having that conversation, I wish I had that conversation with my family. There was, there was times where, you know, my father would ask, what does everyone want this week? Maybe, you know, here and there, but it wasn't uh, a recurring kind of theme. And I wish there was some more, you know, you know, if I, if, if, if I have children in in the future, maybe I I'll incorporate that and have some sort of menu laid out. And this is what we're having today, tomorrow, the, the next week, you know, and then maybe, maybe Friday we'll go out to eat. So I think incorporating kind of Everyone's involved. Everyone can get their hands involved in the kitchen because I think the other win there for me would be that education around where food comes from and how to utilize the whole ingredient and how to waste less in the kitchen too. So then that knowledge is in, is uh, is placed on the child as well. So then they can go then and share that with their family in the future as well. So it it just continues this this long line uh this lineage of uh what's for dinner this week um and people can people will start to share that with their families um so i think i think getting them back in the kitchen getting people in the kitchen and and incorporating them bringing them in the yeah bringing them in the kitchen i i think you must be right because i think it's also a, a a level of just enjoyment and enjoying the blessing of having this food and kind of, it's a mindset. I know, I think for some of uh, us who remember older, older families, there was a tension around food. There was a tremendous tension about we couldn't afford it, or it wasn't going to be available or it during the winter, putting things away. So there was a, a kind of a survival tension, which I think is for many people who would be listening to this podcast is not something they deal with all the time. So they may have these memories of mm. grandparents forcing them to eat old, <laughs> old things that were sitting around because it was, um, there was a fear in, around it rather than a joy. Also, there was no, no, no other option. There was no other, you know, no other choice, but to utilize and use everything you have because you don't know when the next time there would be, you know, this fear was really, was really, uh, fear was present and difficult to, to, I mean, it's difficult for me to comprehend because I, I, I've never had that, that 
that fear of okay when's when's my next when's my next meal i've had moments where uh you know i've tried to cook everything i had in my fridge before i go out and buy more because i'm just waiting if can i get just a, another day closer to that paycheck but mm-hmm. i've never had the moment where i don't know where i'm going to get my next meal so i think it, it's definitely a generational thing and um you know i think there th- there might have been a moment, a gap in between uh, generations where that 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 idea, that ideology of uh, using up everything you have in the, in the fridge um, is important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're you're in the UK now. My dad grew up uh, in in up in London um, after the war. He was Polish Polish refugee. So so this is this is the mindset I have: is Polish mm-hmm. refugees in London and rationing uh, food rationing in in London in the UK for uh, years after the Second World War, well into the wow. into the fifties. So I think it's so nice to have this joyous conversation, this joyous book. You can cook this. Is there anything else? Like, what's one recipe we should go quickly and try from the book? That's that's like asking who, yeah. <laughs> who who my favorite child is if if I had kids. Um, I think my favorite recipe in the whole entire book. It's a fan favorite, and the the reason why I call it a fan favorite is there's rough there's a few dishes in this book that are called fan favorites, and you'll see in the back of the book there's an index with a few dishes that show you recipes I think you should cook right away. These are like all of them you should cook, but these are a few dishes that you should cook right away where you get the essence of the cookbook. And one of those books, or excuse me, one of the recipes uh, is my tofu butter chicken. It's a curry dish and the tofu resembles chicken without the chicken. And all you need to do is have the extra from tofu. You press it to remove some of the water, tear it up uh, into uh, bite-sized pieces, coat it in cornstarch and olive oil, bake it in the oven until the outer edges outside of the tofu is crispy and brown. The inside is going to be soft. It's going to resemble chicken, in my opinion, um, without having too much additive stuff like those those faux uh, vegan uh, chicken companies or, or meat companies. You make this glorious, warming, and comforting. It's almost like soul food for me. It just, it's so comforting and grounding. Um, curry, sautéed onions, ginger, garlic, and uh, a myriad of spices. And that cooks with tomato puree and coconut milk. This mm-hmm. lovely, lovely curry. Add those pieces of uh, tofu chicken. Toss that for a minute or two and serve that with rice or naan. It's so simple. It's easy. I actually might make that tonight for dinner. Well, I think I think we should all make that tonight for dinner. That sounds m- marvelous. And it sounds like one of those, uh, something that should be on weekly or every other week rotation in the family. Yeah, it's it is one of those dishes. I think I was having it once a week um where I was just having it once a week. We I, we all have those dishes where it just becomes a, a rotating dish that comes into the into the family menu at once a week. It's that and then I have this other dish where it's um crispy tofu uh and 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 noodles where I just soak some or cook some Japanese noodles, some soba noodles. Um, or brown rice noodles, steam some veg in the pot with the noodles, and then just fry some tofu in a pan with, again, some spices. And that's another recipe in my book. And that comes together. I can do it now in under 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but some, you know, if, if it's your first time, it may take 15. Um, and then it's finished off with a peanut butter and soy sauce dressing with peanut butter, soy sauce, sesame oil, Japanese vinegar. It's just... That Yum. sounds great. That sounds great. And <laughs> faster than you could possibly order takeout or get in the car and go anywhere. Too fast. Exactly. Ex- exactly. There's times where I, I look at my wife and we go, oh, we're going to do takeaway tonight or we're going to order out. And she's like, mm, okay. And then I look in the fridge and I see what ingredients I have and I go, let me just, I'm just going to cook. It's just going to be, it's just going to be a lot easier if I just cook. Let me just Well, she's cook. a lucky woman to have, have a chef in she the said, house. She's, she, I'm lucky too. She says it every day. I say it every day. So yeah, we're both lucky. That's, that's marvelous. So the book that's coming out in North America, it's already out in the UK. Uh, it's coming out in North America on April 11th, which is tomorrow when, when we're recording this, you can cook this. You can. 
You can. Max Lamana, thank you so much for, for joining us here. I hope everybody's going to try those recipes. First of all, those fan favorites. That sounds like a wonderful way to introduce people to what else is going on there. And they should watch you on Instagram. You're amazing on Instagram. So there's a lot of great information there too. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having this conversation, taking the time and thank you for everyone who's listening. It was a pleasure for all of us, I'm sure. Thank you, Max. So, so what did you think of Max Lamana? You can cook this. You can. Social media, you know, social media comes in for a lot of criticism, but I love and respect the way Max has used his Instagram to find out how to directly help people accomplish this one idea of wasting less food and enjoying the food they do have more. Max has a lot of great information in his book. I, I don't even know if we touched on a, a, a tenth, I think much less than a tenth of, of the short, the tips, the food storage ideas, the recipes. And it's a very beautifully produced book. You would love to give it as a gift. And in fact, I would love to give away, I guess, up to 10 copies of You Can Cook This as my gift to you, my listeners, for writing an honest iTunes review of Veg Your Best on Apple Podcasts. You can just uh, write it, send me a screenshot of the review, and I will send you a hard copy of Max's book to North American listeners and an audio or ebook to those of you outside the U.S. And this is because, listen, I know. It's a hassle to leave a review. <laughs> it is. It's a hassle. And that's why they kind of mean a lot for podcasters like myself. So I will put the directions in the show notes and we will post about it on Instagram. And if you've already left me a review, if you've already gone to that trouble, thank you. Thank you so much. And actually send me a screenshot of your review and I'll see if we can send you a little something too. Okay, kids, let's look for where we can do a little bit better or a lot better with food waste. Maybe let me know your tips. You know, I've been composting, you know, for eons. I grew up, I grew up with composting and I know that sometimes I can use composting, which is a good thing to hide behind. I go, oh, okay, whatever. It's going in the compost. So I'm going to do a little better and we will keep revisiting this very important topic thanks to Max Lamana's visit. And to keep up to date with Max, you're going to find him at Max Lamana, two N's in Mana, MaxLamana.com. And he's all over Instagram. You'll find him. And until next week, waste less and veg your best. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, and that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So until next week, make it easy and veg your best. <laughs>